Well, after a better than expected showing, coming in second place in Iowa, Governor Ron DeSantis' presidential campaign is still in trouble. The next contest, the New Hampshire primary, is this Tuesday. And according to the polls, DeSantis is only in the single digits. So instead, he's spending a lot of time campaigning in South Carolina. The primary there is February 24th, more than a month away. Never back down, the super PAC supporting DeSantis reportedly is laying off staff, a sign that DeSantis' once giant fundraising advantage is shrinking. If former President Trump wins in New Hampshire on Tuesday, it will be a big blow to DeSantis and South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. No Republican who has won two of the first three traditional early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, has ever lost the party's nomination. So, Kimberly, DeSantis had all that money a year ago, and he went to every county in Iowa to campaign. How is he explaining what's happened to his campaign? Well, generally speaking, they are, you know, blaming the media a lot. They're blaming an early call on the race, which did happen only 30 minutes into the caucuses. But what was interesting is that this week, Governor DeSantis did an interview in which he said that he actually should have done more media. He said that he uh, made a mistake by only going on certain outlets at the beginning of his campaign. And, you know, now when you turn on the television, whether it's MSNBC, CNN, uh, Fox News even, uh, you see DeSantis on all of the different networks, but he did initially shun, um, you know, certain outlets. And so he seems to be having a rare uh, bit of introspection about what happened there. Um, having been on the ground in Iowa, I would say that the majority of people that I spoke with, it's not that they didn't like Governor DeSantis, it's just that they liked Trump more. And so they kept on saying to me, why not have Governor DeSantis in 28? So they see a lot of similarities there. They hear what he's saying, and so for a lot of conservative voters that they liked that, but uh, President Trump is really their number one choice. And so they figure why support someone else when you can have Trump now? So that that's just in Iowa, that doesn't mean nationally, that doesn't mean in the general election, but having been on the ground and talked to folks, that was what I observed there. Hey Kimberly, what do we know about DeSantis's fundraising in the last few months? Because a year ago, he was the king of fundraising. What's happened since then? Well, good question. We actually don't have the fourth quarter fundraising numbers yet. Those are due on January 31st. The campaign, of course, can release those numbers earlier if they so choose. Some campaigns have done that when they have really strong numbers, but we haven't heard anything from Governor DeSantis about that. He's been asked multiple times on the campaign trail if he has enough. He sort of brushes it off. He doesn't directly address questions over whether his campaign is broke. Um, but from what I understand, talking to folks on the finance committee for the campaign. They say that he has at least enough to get through South Carolina. Uh, he'll be in South Carolina this weekend, uh, but and he's expected to have a really poor showing in New Hampshire where he's only polling at 5%. So uh, hard to see them going past the next couple of states. And uh, there are plenty of people who think that he already should be dropping out now just because of Trump's formidable lead here. It's interesting you say that because Laura Ingram on Fox on Tuesday night said that DeSantis should drop out. So Mary Ellen, was there ever a path for DeSantis? Was there ever a group of voters who weren't sold on Trump that might have gone for DeSantis? You know, I think um, DeSantis's miscalculations and um, I, in, to some degree, I, I think his kind of, his his instincts are not great. Um, his instincts were because he won so dominantly in, in a re-election campaign that that should allow him to try and topple a cult leader like Donald Trump. And instead, I think he's figured out that um, it, exactly what Republicans have been struggling to do since 2016, and that is try and figure out a way, a way to defeat Donald Trump. And yes, there, you know, there might have been a path for him had he started and identified himself and defined himself um, differently early. Um, right after he won his reelection, he was, you know, kind of on the ascendancy. Um, and that was really the last time, th the lowest point Trump has been in the last year in terms of uh, his political polling. So um, instead, he waited. Um, the interesting thing is, I think he takes Trump literally, and his support and Trump supporters do not. For example, Trump says there's, you know, he's always talking about fake news and how fake news is, uh, 
is his nemesis. And then he talks to reporters all the time and is, you know, his team talks to reporters. Ron DeSantis took it literally and said, fake news is, in, you know, identified it in a way and then avoided talking to reporters. And, um, and that's because he just doesn't quite get it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kirby, I want to put up something on the screen right now. Former President Trump faces a mountain of legal issues in four criminal cases. The former president faces 91 felony counts and two civil lawsuits that could cost him millions of dollars in damages. Reuters Ipsos interviewed more than 4,000 U.S. adults earlier this month and found that if Trump is convicted of a crime, 58 percent of the public, 91 percent of Democrats, 28 percent of Republicans, and 55 percent of independents would not support Donald Trump in November. I'm wondering if both Haley and DeSantis were thinking, well, if Trump just gets into a bit of uh, criminal uh, problems, you know, maybe he's convicted on one of these cases, that there'll be an opening for them to, to push through. Yeah, I think in some in some ways, second place matters more than in any other nomination fight in, in, in recent history. I mean, we've never seen a candidate this old with this many legal vulnerabilities run uh, for a, certainly an, an, another term, a non-consecutive presidential term. But I also uh, sort of wonder, uh, you know, pull, polling is one thing, but when the reality hits and when um, somebody who is as beloved as Donald Trump is uh, gets to the point where he's behind bars, I think that would warp public opinions to the point where it would galvanize his base. Uh, we've already seen it. I mean, that's, I think, one of the big X factors in this uh, nomination fight that Governor DeSantis couldn't have seen coming was was all of these indictments and what it would mean for uh, for, for President Trump's base and and how uh, how much how much the 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 core of support in the Republican Party would rally behind him. Mm -hmm. So you know I think those numbers are one thing, but I, I think that second place is extremely meaningful. But I also wouldn't read too much into what uh, polling numbers say about the general election in such a hypothetical scenario, especially one so unprecedented at this point in time. Because so, so far out. So far out. Yeah. No. Tribal, what are they saying in Tallahassee? What are you hearing about Governor DeSantis in Tallahassee when he finally comes back? I mean, we're assuming you know, that he's not doing well, as everybody said, in New Hampshire. So if he doesn't do well in New Hampshire and South Carolina, what are they saying about his return to Tallahassee? Well, they're looking at his influence and how staying in this race um, and not doing strongly, it's weakening his influence here in Tallahassee. The things that he wants to see happen, like, you know, people will take advantage of that. Um, um, supporters will turn to opponents um, and saying, like, you know, you're not really that strong. You're busy running around the country and not focusing on issues here in, in, in the state. And we can see that in some races that have been in lost. So people are looking, they're looking closely, but there's something to be said about him sticking in and staying to it because you never know until the end, um, considering all the legal troubles uh, Donald Trump is facing. And, you know, looking at the 14th Amendment, that third section of the 14th Amendment that legal folks are looking at as to whether he qualifies um, based on the charges of uh, insurrection. And we'll have to see the outcome of that. Yeah, and he's putting all his eggs in the South Carolina basket. Indeed, indeed. And, and he's trying his best, <laughs> like, you know, staying to it, going to the, the other parts of the country and hoping that, like, you know, staying strong. And Nikki Haley, she has stepped up her game, um, taking the gloves off, if you will, by, by really challenging Donald Trump head to head. This is something that we see most of the Republican candidates have, like, you know, been tepid with, and they're testing the waters more so and going after him. And um, we've seen when you challenge Trump or Trump is challenged directly, he gets their attention, and that brings more media attention to the candidate. So mm -hmm. it's a tactic that uh, that DeSantis might need to step in and, and really play with more to stay in the limelight. Okay.